Hey everyone, what's up? It's Rob Dodson. Today on Polycast, I'm going to take you down the path of creating a public API for your elements. We're also going to be answering questions from the audience, so be sure to stick around for that. First, let's hop into some code. So the first part of creating a public API for your element is declaring public properties. And this has changed a bunch from Polymer 05 to the newest version. Uh, in previous versions of Polymer, if you wanted to declare public properties for your element, there was an attributes attribute that you could put properties in. There was a published object that you could put properties in. And sometimes it was confusing, you know, where should you put your stuff? So in the latest version of Polymer, this has all been consolidated into one single properties object. And it's a very powerful object. So let me show it to you, and we can check out some of the cool things that it does. So first and foremost, I've got an X custom element that I've created here. I've got a properties object, and I've got two properties, first and last. And I've set string to their values, which basically tells Polymer that when someone passes in a value for first and last, that value should be deserialized to a string. So that's really nice. You can deserialize to various other types, like number, object, et cetera. Another cool thing that you can do is you can pass in a default value for a property. So I've got an age property here. I've set its type to number and a default value of 42. You can also create observers for your property. So these are functions that will run whenever the property changes. So here I've set observer to this age changed function. And you know, in previous versions of Polymer, we had this notion of change watchers, which were functions that we kind of secretly implemented for you. If you had a public property, you kind of got one of those functions for free. It was a little bit of magic. Uh, now that it's been sort of removed, and if you want to observe a change, you need to explicitly create an observer like this, which is nice. It sort of, you know, if someone was looking at your code and they weren't quite sure where that function was coming from, uh, this clears up any confusion there. Now, one thing to point out is that. Because this is effectively like a private function, I don't want a bunch of people calling this method. I would only like it to run if my property changes. I'm prefixing it with an underscore. And that's something that we're doing with all the Polymer elements, just to hi highlight to folks that you know, this, is, this is internal to the element and not meant for the outside world to call. Now, another thing that you can do is you can have your element dispatch change events anytime its property is updated. So this is similar to the way that native DOM elements work. You know, you've got input and select and you know, when they change, they actually fire events every single time to notify folks. So adding a notify property to your element is going to dispatch those change events for you. So I'll get an age changed event. And the nice thing is this is actually the basis for the two-way binding system in Polymer. So if you want one of these properties here to be two-way bindable, you need to make sure that you've got notify true set on it. Also, Hopefully, this makes it easier to interop with other frameworks. So there are other frameworks out there that have their own data binding systems. And previously, it was unclear you know, how they could know at what point in a Polymer element's life to, to actually like check for changes. This way, it's getting an event it can listen for that is consistent. And that way, we can hopefully interop with some other data binding systems. Now, another really awesome thing that you can do is create computed properties. So let's say I want to take first and last and combine them together into one value. I can do that here by passing a computed uh, key and then a compute full name function name. And I'm passing in the two properties that I would like to send in as arguments. So I'm passing in first and last. Now, it's important to include these arguments here, because what they do is they tell Polymer that any time first or last changes, this compute full name function should run again to update this value. So very, very useful trick there. Another thing that you can do is create read-only properties. So let's say you have an element with some internal state. You don't want the outside world playing around with it. You can set that property to read-only, so that way folks can only get the value. They can never set it. Now, lastly, one thing that's really cool is you can reflect values back to attributes if you need to. So this is really helpful if someone is trying to style your element with a CSS attribute selector. You probably won't use this guy that much, but it's there if you need it. So the new properties object gives you a ton of power. Let's hop into the code editor and actually put this into practice. So I'm going to start, as I do with all my elements, in a Bower JSON file. I've got an element that I've created called name tag. And in my dependencies, I've listed Polymer 090 RC1. So this is the release candidate for RC1, which is what's currently available at the time of this recording. But if you're watching this, and you know, I'm, I'm assuming by now the 090 tag is actually out. So you can actually take this value here and probably just go ahead and replace it in your Bower JSON with a little caret 090. And that should get you the latest tag of Polymer. 
Now over in my terminal, I'm going to run Bower install to pull down that version of Polymer. And then back in Sublime, I can create a name-tag HTML file. And this is where I'm going to put my elements definition. The first thing I got to do, as always, is use the canonical path to import Polymer. Then I'm going to create a DOM module with an ID that matches my elements tag name, so ID of name tag. And inside of there, I will throw a template. And that's where I'm going to put all of the uh, local DOM content for my, my element. The next thing I need to do is call the Polymer constructor. And I need to give it an is property and pass in my tag name. And then I'm also going to create a properties object for it. And I will create first and last properties. And I'm going to set those to strings. Then I will create a div up here called full name. And I will bind those values up to spans inside of that div. Now, in previous versions of Polymer, you could actually create these binding expressions where you had like multiple values or multiple bindings all kind of mushed into one tag. Currently in Polymer, that is not supported, though it is on the roadmap. So if you need to get both first and last into this div, you got to wrap them inside of spans, which is a little funky. And we're going to come back to this point in a moment. But, but so far, just with this right here, we're ready to preview our element. So I'll go to my index file. And I'm going to import the definition for my name tag element. And then down in the body, I can drop in a name tag. And I can configure it with first and last values. So I'm just going to pass in my name as those values. Next, I'm going to run the trusty polyserve module to actually preview my element. Polyserve is a little local node server that you can use to test out your component. It plays very nicely with Bower. If you have no idea what I'm talking about, you can check out this video right here. We've got a full episode which explains how to get up and running with Polyserve. If you are building a lot of elements, this is an invaluable tool. So it is worth your time to check out that episode. Now over in Chrome, I'm going to refresh the page. And you can see over here, I'll kind of boost this up a little bit for you, that my name is now showing up. So I've got first and last. Those binding values are being displayed there. It's a little boring, right? But at least you can see it works. And back in my element definition, I'm going to try to clean this up a little bit. Because having those spans there is a little bit of a funky hack. And to do that, I'm going to use a computed property. So in my properties object, I will create a full name property. And I'm going to say it's computed, and then it computes first and last. And then down here, I can actually implement that method. So it takes first and last as arguments. It returns a string that is the concatenated values. Then up in my div, I can just drop in a binding for full name. Now, the next thing I want to do to make this tag look a little bit nicer is actually add some styles in here. So I'm styling the host, and I'm styling that full name div. And what this is going to give me when I go back to Chrome and refresh the page is something that looks a little bit more like a name badge. And you can see that I still see my full name there using that computed property. OK, I'm going to clue you in on a little pro tip now. If you'd like to declare your computed properties in line, you can totally do that. And that's really useful if you want to have a computed property maybe only in one place. It'll keep your properties object nice and tidy. So let me show you how to do that. So to declare a computed property in line, we can actually delete this full name property that we've got here. And then up in our binding, we can just call compute full name, pass in first and last properties. And then that's going to call this guy and return a value. So going back to Chrome, refresh the page, I see the exact same thing. But I've tidied up my properties object a little bit. And this, again, is helpful if you have a, a property that maybe you're only using in one place. Now, one last thing I want to show you is how to add a public method to your component. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add like a shake method so that the name tag actually wiggles around a little bit. So to do that, I'm going to start off with a little bit of CSS. And notice this host selector that I've written here. So I'm targeting the host. And then I've got these parentheses, and I'm passing in a class name. And what that does is it allows the element to reference itself. It's basically saying, if I have a class called shake applied to me, then use all of these styles. I'm just creating an animation here. What I'm going to do is drop in some keyframes. and these keyframes just have the element go to the right a little, to the left a little, and then back to the center. And then I've got the you know, vendor prefixed versions of those keyframes as well. So uh, you know, Moz keyframe, WebKit keyframe, et cetera. So it looks like a lot more code than it really is. Now I'm ready to go down to my prototype, and I can actually implement a shake method. So all I'm doing is I'm saying this.classless.toggle, that shake class. So you're going to add it. The element's going to shake around. 
You're going to toggle it so it'll get removed, call it again, the element shakes around, etc. So we hop over to Chrome, and I can pop up in the Dev Tools and use this little inspector here to select my element in the document. I can see that I've got it highlighted there. And I can hit Escape to open up my console. And I'll show you a neat trick if you haven't seen it before. When you're in the console and you've got an element selected up there, you can hit dollar sign zero to actually select that element. It's like calling query selector. So now I can just say dollar sign zero, call that shake public method, and you'll see it shaking. I can call it again, and you'll see that that class that we added gets removed because we're calling classless toggle. Call it again, it shakes. Call it again, class gets removed, so on and so on. So a bit of a quick and dirty example, but now you know how to add public properties and public methods to your element. So there you have it. You now know how to create the public API for your element. Now, don't run away just yet. Stick around, because in Q&A time, we're going to be answering questions from the audience and giving away some swag. Be sure to click that little subscribe button. As always, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. All right, folks, Q&A time. Today's question comes from Cash Cummings, who asks, You've mentioned using the deep combinator before to style elements can be dangerous because it can cause unintended side effects. Is there a more general way to style elements that doesn't require knowing all about their internals? So really great question, Cash. Thanks for sending that in. This is actually one of the cooler features of the latest version of Polymer. Uh, we've got a brand new styling system. It's still experimental, but it has shipped. You can follow this link right here to read more about it. It is based on CSS variables and custom properties. And I personally think it's so cool. The next episode of Polycast is actually going to be all about it. So stay tuned for that. Again, thank you, Cash, for sending in your question. To all of you out there, please send more questions down in the comments. We'll send you some swag if you get featured. As always, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.